In normal conditions, the blood vessels stay in a relaxed state by producing nitric oxide and prostaglandins, specifically prostacyclins. Now, these keep the blood vessels in a relaxed or a dilated state, which is why they're called vasodilators. Now, these prostaglandins also prevent the platelets from aggregating and so blood clotting will be avoided. But when the vessel is getting damaged due to an injury, now a body needs to act quickly to reduce the blood flow. Our story is starting from this vessel damage. Now, immediately after a blood vessel has been cut or ruptured, the trauma to the vessel wall will cause the smooth muscles in the wall to contract. Now, this instantaneously reduces the flow of blood from the ruptured vessel. Now, vasoconstriction or vessel spasm, as we call it, is an intrinsic action of the blood vessels. Remember, the contraction can result from either a local myogenic spasm, nervous reflexes that are initiated by pain nerve impulses or other sensory impulses that originate from traumatized vessels or nearby tissues. Or they may be a result of local autocoid factors from either the vessel wall or by the blood platelets. Now, autocoids are hormones that act locally or have a paracrine effect. In the case of vasoconstriction, the autocoid acting here is endothelin. Now you can guess by its name that it is released by the endothelial cells in the blood vessel wall and causing vasoconstriction. And for smaller vessels, the platelets are mainly responsible for much of the vasoconstriction. They release a vasoconstrictor substance known as thromboxane A2. We will talk about this ahead. You must keep in mind, the more severely a vessel is traumatized, the greater the degree of vascular spasm. Now, the spasm can last for many minutes or even hours. Now, during this time, the process of platelet plugging and blood coagulation can take place. After vasoconstriction, we would require a very quick fix that will immediately clog the leakage of our pipes, which were obviously our blood vessels. Now here, the primary hemostasis comes into play. In primary hemostasis, a temporary fix to the leakage is applied. Just like how you would immediately jam a cloth or anything that is lying next to you to stop the leakage from a pipe. Similar things are happening during a platelet plug formation. So if we take a look at the three steps that are involved in the platelet clot formation. The first step is the adhesion, where the platelets come and stick to the endothelial wall. The second step is activation, where certain mechanisms are turned on that further aid in the adhesion process and reinforce the platelets. And third and last step is aggregation of the platelets. Now this occurs to strengthen this plug even further. So the damage of the vessel is exposing the collagen fiber in the vessel walls. The question arises, is there a way for the platelets to bind to the collagen? Yes, it happens via integrin receptors. But we also need a glue so more and more platelets can bind to these collagen fibers. Now this is where the von Willebrin factor comes in. Now my friend Dr. B will tell you a very interesting fact about the von Willebrin factor. Von Willebrandt factor is a blood glycoprotein involved in hemostasis. It is named after a Finnish physician. The deficiency of this factor results in von Willebrandt disease, in which the blood of the patients does not clot properly. So, this factor is very important. So, if you note that this factor avidly binds to the glycoprotein receptors on the platelets, specifically glycoprotein complex GPIB95. Now together these cause the adhesion of the platelets to the damaged area or the tethering of the platelet to the collagen fibers will occur on the damaged side. The first step was platelet adhesion. 
Now, after this adhesion, the platelets will initiate platelet activation. Just take an example of a police patrol. In this case, the platelets are the police patrol. So, what will they do? They will not only use weapons to fight the robbers or intruders, which in this case is the injury itself, but they will also call for backup. So, the platelets will not only get activated, but they will also call upon other platelets to get activated as well. So, let's see how this is actually happening. First up, this binding triggers the platelets to change shape and then cause granular release. Now, this is occurring by increasing the intracellular calcium, which basically activates the actin filaments that are present in the platelets. And so, the platelets change shape and put out pseudopodia. Now, imagine the platelets have grown arm-like projections to hold themselves together and to increase the surface area for receptor adhesion. Now, if we zoom into the platelets, we can see that the granular release that is also happening in activation happens via the activation of phospholipase C pathway that is triggered by the conformational change of the receptor. Now, this increases the inositol 3 phosphate in the cell. They're inactivating the calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum, and the cytoplasmic calcium concentration is increased. Now, similarly, the increased calcium will result in the release of thromboxane A2 from delta or dense granules. Do you remember? We talked about thromboxane A2 when we were talking about vasoconstrictors must remember that this is a very potent vasoconstrictor. Now, if we look at the formation of this thromboxane A2, this belongs to the lipid family. It is not only produced in activated platelets, but also macrophages and endothelial cells. Now, since they are lipids, it is basically formed by phospholipids in the granular membranes. These are acted upon by enzymes to produce arachidonic acid. Then a very important enzyme comes into play, that is the cyclooxygenase or COX. Now this converts the arachidonic acid to prostaglandins. Now remember, these prostaglandins were vasodilators. But we need a vasoconstrictor here, so the thromboxane synthase is another enzyme that will act upon this and produce thromboxane A2. So the release of thromboxane by the platelets will not only cause vasoconstriction, but it will also stimulate the release of other substances, which are mainly serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine, also sometimes referred to as 5-HT, and also ADP from the platelet granules. Now, if you look at the serotonin, we will see that it will act together with the thromboxane to act in-house and quickly and further enhance the vasoconstriction. Now, if we recall in the beginning, endothelin was also involved in vasoconstriction. So now, thromboxane and serotonin will also act together as friends to reduce the blood flow. So now the question arises, how will these platelets call for backup? Which is the signals that they will send out and call upon other police forces to come and act on this injured area, or fight the robbers in this case. So if you notice, this ADP is basically responsible for initiating or sending out signals. Now this ADP is responsible for then propagating this process and calling up backup. Basically to do what? Yes, to activate other platelets. Now, this activation occurs by binding to the purinergic receptors or P2Y receptors on other platelets. Okay, so this brings us to the third step of the platelet plug formation, which is aggregation. So when the platelets are basically activated, they all gather around the spot of the leakage. Now, it also causes the activation of the fibrinogen receptors on their surface. Now, this receptor binds to the fibrinogen in the plasma. Now, these are the most abundant integrin receptors. 
and they cause the platelets to all become sticky and facilitate the irreversible binding of these platelets to the exposed extracellular matrix, which in this case was the collagen, and then enables the cross-linking of adjacent platelets. So now you can see that the police force or the platelets are all working together. Now this will all lead to platelet aggregation and form a soft platelet plug on the damaged spot. So in the beginning, I mentioned to you that the time required for this platelet plug to form is actually noted as the bleeding time and is almost two to four minutes in normal conditions. Do note that this bleeding time is clinically relevant when it is increased to 10 minutes or more. Well, this usually occurs during any bleeding disorder where any of these factors that we talked about right now are missing or even deficient. Like the von Willebrand factor was actually deficient in the case of von Willebrand disease. Now, the formation of this platelet plug was just a temporary fix employed by the body. Now, remember that the police force over here is just fighting the robbers. We also need to lock them up in a jail cell. So to lock them up, we need what? A permanent fix. Now, since this soft platelet plug is already in place, it needs to be further stabilized during clotting by conversion of this fibrinogen that was attaching to the fibrinogen receptors on the platelets to fibrin. Now, this will act as a glue to fix this platelet plug in place. Let's see how this happens in the next section when we go over the secondary hemostasis.